Grace, mercy, and peace are yours this day from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, I think we like to imagine that the devil has a lot more power than he actually does when it comes to temptation. He is a fallen angel, a great dragon. He is a lion that prowls about, seeking those whom he may devour. Fierce, fine, whatever. It's whatever. You Christian still wear the armor of God. You are baptized. He might be a lion, but he has no teeth to you. He is not all-powerful. The devil is not all-knowing. The devil didn't make you do anything. Because Satan isn't God. He is nothing more than a student of character. He watches. It's creepy. He's been doing it for a long time, since Adam and Eve. He never could read your thoughts. He never really had to either. He just pays attention. And so he knows us. He knows what questions to ask. He knows just where to poke. You know too. It's that place that you hide in your heart, but not as well as you think. It's the place where the guilt piles up, the frustration, the fear, the shame. This is where the knife goes. Then it's really only about leverage. Leverage is not about power. You can lift a lot with just a little if you know where to pull. And the devil is so used to this trick working that you can actually watch him overplay his hand when it comes to our Lord. Jesus stands in the wild lands, and the devil goes out to confront him with the only tricks that he knows. First, he comes in weakness. Jesus hungers. Forty days, no food. If you really are the Son of God, turn rocks into bread. Temptation. Poke at where you are weak, where you lack. Measure God's love by your satisfaction. If you really are so important, you shouldn't want for anything. The enemy leans on our weaknesses as if it could somehow prove that there was no God, or worse, that God just won't help us. But the Lord answers, man cannot live by bread alone. God's love means more than stuff or earthly pleasure. So the devil comes again in strength, Jesus' faith. If you really know your Bible, you know that you can throw yourself down from here. The psalm says it. He will command his angels concerning you, and they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. You trust more than anyone. He tempts us to trust in what is strongest about ourselves. It is the devil who gives you self-esteem. It is the devil who gives you confidence, and then he twists it in on itself until it gets too big to fail. But sooner or later, humanity always falls. You can watch him work. He takes strong faith and tries to corrupt it, twist trust in God into trust in faith. But faith in faith has saved nobody. So Jesus answers, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test, not just don't poke the bear, but recognize, it is God who saves, not your ability to impress him. Don't bet on that. Don't test God that way. So finally, Satan comes in fear. But really, that's just what all these things get rolled up into anyway. There's a lot that you don't know, and too much of what you do is bad news. So if you bow, you can control it all. He will give you every kingdom. You can have whatever you want. Fear is really just weakness and strength all rolled together into one thing. We want control. So Satan tempts us into looking to our own will instead of trusting in God's. It was fear that didn't want to starve and hurt in weakness. It was fear that thought it was the one that should be in control in strength as if we were somehow smarter than God but mostly just because the dark unknown is even scarier than the weaknesses that we do know. And even if I don't even know what I would do with control, I still want it. Because deep down, I'm afraid to trust anybody who would ever hold control over me. So when it comes to God, it's a whole lot easier to pray that my will be done than his. 
And it's really no different here than in the garden when the serpent would tempt Adam and Eve. It's really no different here than when Satan would mock Jesus through the Pharisees, even as he dies for them. If you really are the son of God, come down from there. I know who talks like that. It is the one who meets Jesus in the wildlands and leads every temptation in the exact same way. Satan overplays his hand and he accidentally teaches us his favorite word. The devil's favorite word is if. He leads every temptation this way. I always figured it would be a dirtier word. There's a really cold look in the mirror for me when I realized I had a fouler mouth than Satan. But the devil, his favorite word is if. It is the one he keeps falling back on. If you are the son of God, make these stones bread. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down and trust him. I will give you all of the kingdoms of the world if you just bow to me. And we still echo it. When it comes to temptation, we love to say the devil's own favorite word. If only we were not so overwhelmed. If only we were not around those bad influences. If only they didn't give me a reason. We could deal with temptation just like Jesus. If only we knew the right Bible verses just like he always seems to. Then we would be able to resist. If is the devil's favorite word because there is no certainty to it at all. And the devil only wants doubt. We use it on our kids. You can watch TV if you clean your room which means they're not watching TV. You can get a raise if you meet your goals. You can fix your marriage if you stop being a sinner. It is a word of law, not gospel, because the word if is always on you. You can test it. You broke the Ten Commandments this week. Did you not know them? You knew the right Bible verse. Thou shalt not. You just leaned harder on the word if than anything after it. We deal with temptation wrong. You will not beat temptation with the devil's own words. You will only play further into it because, because you knew. You knew when you did it. Temptation is not ignorant. Temptation is knowing that something is wrong and doing it anyway. That's what makes it so vile. It has to excuse the things that it already knows. So it tries to measure right and wrong. Even God himself, by something different, than what he makes clear to us in his word. Every single time, every single way, it all comes down to this thing. You can dress it up for the dance, but it is the same old lie of the same old enemy. If God were really loving, I would not hurt. If it feels good, a loving God wouldn't call it wrong. So it can't matter that much. That is temptation. And we fall to it. All of us. Over and over again. So, for every time that you have grabbed hold of the devil's favorite word to excuse your sins and slander your Lord or build yourself up because you were scared, Jesus loves you. And that love actually looks like something. It looks like a cross where our Lord bleeds and dies for you. Your sins are forgiven you. All of them. Every time you have fallen into temptation, God has met it with this cross for you. Your sins are forgiven you. All of them. Jesus died for you. Jesus died for those who struggle and fall into temptation that even in the midst of it, you would have hope. Because answering temptation is not a measurement of how many Bible verses you know. It is a measurement of how many of them are true. Jesus falling back on the word is not a challenge to memorize more scripture than the devil. You will lose. It is so that you will recognize that there are wills that are outside of your own. Satan's will for you is bad. God's will for you is good. That mess that you are in, it's not by chance. But that mess that you are in, there is hope inside of it. See how Jesus confronts the devil. He does not simply recite memorized lines. He falls upon the Father's will. Remember why Jesus is in the wilderness starving. It is God's will. Remember why he stands toe to toe with the devil and does not budge an inch. Remember why he was offered every single pleasure and instead chose a cross. It was for you. It was to save you. 
Jesus bled and died to save you. And so all of your sins are forgiven. Now stop feeling bad about it because that's the devil steering us away from God's will too. It was God's will to die to save you sinners. Rejoice that he loves us that much that nothing that you have ever done or failed to do can change that fact. When the devil confronts us and twists the scriptures, measure it against what you see in the will of God. He died and rose to save you. He gives you grace in word and sacrament. He has mercy day after day week after week, year after year. God's will puts him in the desert to confront Satan. It is not a quest for happiness. It is not a quest for power. It is not a desire to see a miracle. Our Lord wills salvation for sinners so we can measure God's presence by the same, not in happiness, not in power, not in a quest to see a miracle, but in a hope to see a cross. Salvation for you to undo the curse of Adam, to make straight the twisted paths that we pave for ourselves, and to conquer the enemy who would work against God's will. Our Lord was tempted. Our Lord was stood. Our Lord was crucified. And our Lord is risen. This is for you, especially if you're a sinner. Because if you're not a sinner, there is no salvation here for you. That's all we do here. Jesus for sinners. If you're not willing to call your sin a sin, the cross will have no meaning for you. If you are not able to see that Jesus dying for sinners in the scriptures that you are hearing, you are looking in the wrong place. So start upon the cross. It did something. Not only are you forgiven, but you are victorious today. The devil has lost today. Even if you fall into temptation today, the devil has still lost. His temptations are different to you now. Now, Now, not only are you holy enough to cast aside your old excuses, you are holy enough to not need them anymore. Why excuse what God forgives? Bring it to the cross. Leave it here. Know that it is bled for and know that you are forgiven. And then do something bold. Resist. If you want to outmuscle the devil, you will not have the strength. You will not have the leverage. But you do have the Lord. You do have his word. And you do have a place to hear it, to grow in it, to receive the forgiveness that it proclaims and enacts. Resist here. Try, absolutely. But do not measure resistance in your ability to conquer a sin on your own. Measure it in the victory over sin and the grave. Pray the litany. Hear the word. Eat and drink the body and blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of all your sins. This is where leverage is. This is where victory is. It is outside of you. It is outside of your will. It is outside of your works. But it is wholly and completely in God's where it should be because God is stronger and his will is going to get done no matter what. So rejoice because his will is your salvation. He wills that you live in the name of Jesus. Amen.